Now, there's a very, very famous children's story book. It was written by a guy. Actually, his real name is not uh, Dr. Seuss, but that's his pen name, Dr. Seuss. It's a Christmas story. It's been made into cartoons and movies. I think probably everybody here has heard of it. It's, uh, it's called what? How the, the Grinch Stole Christmas. Yeah, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And uh, I found out at 9 o'clock, everybody remembers this story. Everybody knows. You've all seen it, right? Yeah. Movies. And uh, I thought Jim Carrey did a great role of playing the Grinch. The Grinch, obviously, is a completely fictional character, right? He's just made up. He's not, that's not a real species of, of animal or anything. He's just, a, he's just a, a, a figment of this guy's imagination. He's totally invented. But what we know about him in the fictional story is that he's very mean. He's just a grumpy, grouchy, unpleasant guy. Uh, in fact, there's a song, Mr. Grinch, you know the song? Here's some of the lyrics. This is, this is what it says about the Grinch. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. You really are a heel. You're as cuddly as a cactus. You're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. You're a bad banana with a greasy black peel. <laughs> yeah, remember that one? The guy with the real low voice? You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. Uh, uh, here's another, I won't read all the lyrics, but here's another one of the lyrics, another one of the verses. You're a monster, Mr. Grinch. Your heart's an empty hole. Your brain is full of spiders. You have garlic in your soul, Mr. Grinch. I wouldn't touch you with a 39 and a half foot pole. I see people mouthing the words. Yeah. And of course, part of the story is that the Grinch tries to ruin Christmas. That's, that's sort of the, that's the conflict of the story. He's, he's ruining, he wants to ruin Christmas for a bunch of people. These are invented people too, a town called Whoville. And I think they're just Who's, aren't they? Are they Who's? Yeah. They're Who's. They're the Who's who live in Whoville. Again, it's all fictional. But the way he tries to ruin Christmas is he steals all the presents and all the food and all the decorations from the town so that uh, on Christmas Eve and into the Christmas morning, so that when they all awake on Christmas morning, when they awaken, everything, it's empty. All their stuff is gone, but it doesn't ruin Christmas for them, right? right. Because he discovers that Christmas is actually in their heart. So, as you know, the name of the story is The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. Because of this really well-known story, the word Grinch, just that word now has an association with it. Like in our culture, there's an understanding. If somebody calls you Grinch, they're not saying something nice about you, right? Somebody calls me Grinch, it's negative. We don't know for sure what that means, but we know it's not nice. I'm not a good guy. I'm not a good person. In the Bible, in the story of Jesus' birth, there is a person who you could kind of refer to as a Grinch. Um, He's more than that in many, many ways, and he's a real character. He's not a fictitious character. Um, but this is the this guy is sort of like the Grinch who almost really did steal Christmas. The person I'm referring to is a guy named Herod. You've heard this name before probably, right? If you're familiar with the New Testament, there's actually several people uh, who, who were Herods. Uh, the one who's in the Christmas story, in the, in, the, in the story of Jesus' birth, this is in Matthew chapter 2, has come to be known as Herod the Great. He was actually a, a, a very, very effective and capable guy in some ways, but he wasn't a good guy in some other ways. So I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Matthew chapter 2, and let's read a little bit of this account that Matthew gives to us. Matthew chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. And then just keep the Bible open, because I'm going to pick up and, and read a little bit further then. But let me, I'll read verses 1 through 12 first. Book of Matthew, that's the first book of the New Testament, chapter 2, and I'm going to start at verse 1. If you have it, say yes. 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 Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of, here he is, King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, Where's the newborn king of the Jews? We saw a star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Stop for just a minute. Kings, in a general sense, don't ever like hearing about another king that's out there. Wait, what, what? 
There's another king? What? They don't like that. Herod in particular, uh, he was very paranoid about this kind of thing. Well, I'll tell you a little bit more about him in just a few minutes. So he's like, what, wait, what, what's this king stuff? That, that's bothering him. Pick up at verse 4. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem and Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people, Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem, search carefully for the child. When you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. <laughs> if, this were a, if this were a movie, you'd hear like a crack of lightning at that point. <laughs> and like <laughs> evil laughter. I want to go worship him. Is Herod interested in worshiping a, this little baby king? No. No. Verse 9, after this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Um, this was not... This was not in, where the manger is and all that. A lot of times we see the wise wise men where, where you know they're in the in the stable. This was probably one to two years later. Bible scholars say uh, Mary and Joseph were in a house somewhere there in Bethlehem. So this was this was after you know the the, the actual night of Jesus' birth. Also. It's legend that there were three wise men, but the Bible never says that. We don't know for sure that there were actually three of them. There were three gifts, so people think, well, there maybe were three wise men, but we don't actually know that for a fact. Um, so let's pick up again. Mary, they bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of, we'll, we'll see three gifts here, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Verse 12, when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. God's protecting the little one. God's protecting him. God made sure that uh, they went home a different way. You know, um, uh, so here's Herod, and uh, he's really more of a Grinch than, than this Grinch. Someone was, I was saying, you know, 150 years ago, nobody even knew who the Grinch was, and somebody came out afterwards and said, no, and no, 150 years ago, it would have been Scrooge. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. There's always been some kind of a villain down through history. So we have Herod in this story. But again, this is not a made-up story. This is real and true, and it actually happened. Um, uh, Herod was a cruel, vicious, paranoid Ego-centered. Like, like you want to talk about ego? Herod is like ego on steroids. So because Herod felt threatened by what he heard about this, this king is born, this baby, you probably know the story. He has all the little boys in that area who are two years old and younger killed because of the threat that that, that uh, feels like to him. Here, we'll keep reading. We're still in Matthew chapter 2. Now look at, uh, we'll start at verse 16. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. Think about this. One guy, one guy, just because he feels threatened, just because of his paranoia, because he, and because he's literally a ruthless, ruthless person with power. People who are ruthless and have power... What a dangerous, ugly thing. He has both. So he has all the little boys, two years and younger, in this region around Bethlehem, killed. Can you imagine, at that time, the, the anguish and the pain around there? 
the, the grief, I mean, it's just, it's horrible. Horrible. Saying that Herod is the Grinch who almost stole Christmas is, you know, trying to go for a little humor here, but it's putting it way too mildly. Way too mildly. I did some reading about Herod. I've heard some things about him before and read some things before. I did some reading this week. Here are some descriptions of Herod that I read this week. Just a couple of brief descriptions in various research, uh, uh, resource books. Quote, Herod the Great was a brutal man who killed his father-in-law, several of his ten wives, and two of his own sons. End of quote. This guy's killing family members. Because they feel like a threat to him. Here's another resource puts it like this uh, about Herod. Quote, he always feared potential rivals. He had his wife's brother, Aristobulus, the high priest, drowned in his swimming pool in the palace. He put to death 46 members of the Sanhedrin. He killed his mother-in-law. He also had his wife Miriam murdered, along with two of their sons, as he considered them potential rivals with legitimate claim to the throne. End of quote. This is not a good guy. You hear the name Herod, especially this guy, Herod the Great, not good. Here are some of the words, again, as I was reading about Herod this week, here's some of the words that were used to describe Herod. Schemer, monster, Ruthless, distrustful, jealous, brutal, and a cruel tyrant. Not a good guy. Not a good guy. Terrible, terrible. Now, there's a very helpful and interesting point that's played out in this story, and we see it. We see God's hand in this story. And, and the point that it kind of helps reinforce to us is this one. This is really important. This is a really important point. Take this point home with you. God's purposes will prevail. God's purposes prevail. When, when Herod tried to get rid of Jesus by killing all the baby boys, he probably wasn't thinking of it in this sense. He probably didn't have this grand of a vision of it all. He probably wasn't thinking, I, Herod, am now going to defeat God's purposes in the world. I, he probably wasn't thinking of it like that. We don't know for sure, but probably not. He was probably just thinking, there's a potential king out there and I want to get rid of him. Herod was paranoid, afraid of losing power. Again, we already talked about it. He had members of his own family killed because he thought they're plotting against him. Any possible threat at all. To, uh, to his power was something that Herod wanted to retaliate against. He would eliminate immediately if he could. Any possible threat, you're gone. So Herod, again, he probably wasn't thinking, I'm going to thwart God's plans in the world. He wasn't thinking that way, probably. But in a sense, whether he knew it or not, Herod was trying to, to stop God from providing a way of salvation to the world. Because Jesus is the Savior, right? So if you get rid of Jesus, you're stopping salvation. Do you like the idea of salvation, by the way? Yes. Yeah, amen. yeah, yeah, me too. Salvation is a really, really good thing. If you're a person who needs to be saved, salvation is a really good thing. By the way, I'm a person who needs to be saved. You're a person who needs to be saved. Here's some good news, though. God's purposes are going to prevail because he's God. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. God is supreme. He's ultimately in control. And so God's purposes are going to happen. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, we have this great truth. It says this. This is in a proverb. Proverbs 19, 21. It says, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Plan, plan, plan. And by the way, it's not wrong to make plans either. Make plans, but... Understand, the Lord's purposes are going to prevail. God's purposes happen in a, in a very interesting context, too. If you think about it, so God's got these purposes. But he gives every single human being, you, me, everybody, there's billions of human beings on planet Earth, he gives us free will. 
He lets us do things, make choices. He makes us, uh, he lets us make consequential choices, choices that matter. How about this? God allows this. He allows you and I to make sinful choices if we want to. Bad choices, wrong choices. He allows that freedom. I made choices in my life. At the time, I probably figured, well, this is going to be advantageous to me. And it turned out not to be good choices. How about you? Made some bad choices along the way. God didn't stop me. Good choices, but he free will. God allows this. So again, we have this incredible reality. Billions of human beings making all kinds of choices, doing all kinds of things. Think about this. Some of the human beings on planet Earth are incredibly powerful and influential. They make choices that affect lots and lots of lives. God allows all of these choices and all of these things to happen. And yet, even with all that going on, God is still able to bring about his ultimate purposes. It's interesting. This is the kind of thing that philosophers talk about. This really says something amazing. It says something powerful. It says something profound about God and who he is and his nature and his capabilities and his qualities. This says something incredible about the sovereignty of God. That he can allow us to do all these things and his purposes are still going to happen. Proverbs 19, verse 21. You can make many plans. Go ahead. Plan, plan, plan. God's purposes are going to prevail. And sometimes we throw this word awesome around a little too freely, I think. I do it, I know. I'm like, oh man, this is an awesome ice cream cone. <laughs> awesome. The fact that God can allow, and, and through, through history, has allowed billions of people to have free will and do things, and yet he can still bring about his purposes, that should strike us with awe. That's like the greatest chess game on earth, only chess times a, a gazillion. So Herod tried to thwart God's plans. But God's plans with Jesus continued. Herod couldn't stop it. By the way, you know, we're talking about Herod this morning and, and trying to stop Jesus and everything. <clears throat> Understand that while Jesus was here on earth, there was always somebody trying to stop him. There was always somebody working against him. There's always somebody who just didn't get it, somebody who's trying to misunderstand him, somebody who's trying to resist him. When, when Jesus began his ministry, religious leaders were working against him constantly. Somebody's always been trying to stop God's plan. Always. It's the nature of the world that we live in. You know what happened ultimately is, well, we're going to stop Jesus. We'll stop him. They nail him to a cross. That's the end of that. Was it the end? Here we are, 2,000 years later, still talking about him. That wasn't the end. This resistance to God and the truth of God, this resistance to God's way of life, it's part of the world that we live in. There are people who try to stop God's purposes today. They're still trying. In fact, some of us who are believers, sometimes I know because I have discussions about this kind of thing. Sometimes believers look around and they go, the people who are, trying, who are working against God, they're winning. They're the ones who are winning in this world. They're, they're stopping God's purposes. You need to understand something. They're not stopping God's purposes. There's bad things that are happening. I, I'm not, this, I'm not uh, denying that. There's evil things happening. There's, all, there's evil in the world. There are bad people doing bad things. I'm not denying that. They will not stop. They cannot stop the purposes of God. Amen. Can't do it. Kill all the baby boys. I'll get them that way. No. Put them on a cross. Kill them. That takes care of that. Nope. You can't stop them. God's purposes will prevail. Hey, I got some great news. God wins. God wins. You say, ah, oh, I'm not into that kind of thing. He wins anyhow. You shake, somebody shaking their fist at God, that doesn't stop him. 
So, here's a thought. If God's purposes are ultimately going to prevail, and they are, then it seems like it would be wise for us to get on board with God's purposes, doesn't it? Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost like you get to know who wins the football game in advance, so I'm going to bet on them in advance. I'm going to bet on God and go with him because I already know in advance that he's going to win. You see, this is what happens, though, sometimes. Sometimes. I've been around Christianity for a long time. Not always. Sometimes this is what happens. Among Christians, we come up with plans. They may be very nice plans, by the way. Good plans. We got a plan, we put our plan together, and then we hope and pray that God will bless our plans. And God, please bless my plans, my purposes, my objectives. Basically, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, God, get on board with my plans, would you please? Get on board with me. This is, by the way, this is not bad or wrong or evil or anything. But think about it. Whose plans prevail? God. Yeah. God's, God knows what's best. God knows what's going to happen. God's way is the right way. God is supreme. So I'm not saying it's bad to plan and ask God to, to get on board. I'm not even saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is it's wiser. In the long run, it will be more effective for us to get on board with God's plans. Doesn't that make sense? Say yes. 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 Here, think about it. Put it this way. Just put it like this. Does God need to get with me or do I need to get with God? I need to get with God. Yeah. There's a terrific quote from Abraham Lincoln, and I knew that I had read it a long time ago, and it came to my mind this week, and I'm like, what was that quote by Lincoln? So fortunately, Google and all this kind of stuff, I found the quote. This is what Lincoln said one time. Great quote. Could, he could have put this in a, in a sermon somewhere. Abraham Lincoln, quote, My concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. End of quote. I believe he was talking, I, I, I couldn't find the document that, that was written in, but I think it was when he was dealing with, with you know, slavery and, and the Civil War and all that. Talk about tension. My concern is not whether God is on our side. I'm sure Lincoln had, you know, people, pray that God is on our side, pray that God is on our side, Lincoln. No, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My concern is to be on God's side. It's a great perspective. Here, think about it. If I say, I'm hoping God gets on my side, there's a sense in which here's how I'm looking at it. I'm in the leadership role, and I'm hoping God will come along and follow me. That's kind of what I'm saying, right? Since God is who he is, since God is omniscient, that's a fancy word omniscient, means he knows literally everything, the wiser approach would be, God, let's do it this way. You lead and I'll follow. Remember the proverb? You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. It just seems wiser to get on board with God and his purposes. Doesn't it? Say yes. yes. You say, how do I do that, Dan? How do I get on board with God's purposes and, and all that kind of thing? Well, one real simple way would be to do this. Make sure the, that you're living the way God calls us to live in his word. You want to get on board with God's purposes? Well, then live the way God calls you to live. See, almost everybody in this, I don't know every single person who's watching online, but just about everybody here, you know a lot about how God wants you to live. You know a lot about that. If I said, does God want you to do this, and I name some kind of an activity, you could probably tell me, yeah, he probably doesn't want me to do that. God wants you, does God want you to rob a liquor store? You already know the answer. So you don't even have to go to search the Bible. You already know the answer to that. Yes? Yes. Oh, here's a person who's in need. Should I help him or shouldn't I? You already know the answer to that, right? Yes. You know a lot about what God wants you to do. So... Live the way. See, have you tried to claim that you're following God while at the same time you're knowingly going against what he tells us to do in his word? Live the way God tells us to live. That's how you get on board. Here's another way you get on board with God's plans. I read this a number of years ago. It was very helpful to me. Because in ministry, they're always saying, follow God. Do what God tells you to do. Okay, 
but in a practical sense, help me. So here was a practical idea. Where do you already see God at work? Like in your life, do you see God at work somewhere? Do you see God at work in your church? Do you see God, the hand of God involved in some way in your family, in your job, with the people that you hang out? If there's some place where you already see God's working, you already see the evidence God's moving in this, join up with God in what he's already doing. What, where is he already doing something? Well, let me get on board with God. Again, the idea here is, hello, come in. <laughs> the idea here is he leads, we follow. Yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah. God sent his son to this earth, the king. The king comes as a helpless, defenseless baby who came to bring salvation to a world that desperately needed and still needs a savior. In the meantime, you got this earthly king. He feels threatened by this baby. Herod should have rejoiced. He, doesn't, he didn't understand that, but the, the salvation that Jesus offered was offered to him too. He should have rejoiced, but he didn't. He was paranoid. He felt, felt threatened. And uh, frankly, Herod didn't understand the full scope of what he was trying to do, I believe, but he was trying to stop God's plans. I'm so thankful that God's plans prevailed. How about you? Yes. Not Herod's. We thank you, Lord, that your plans always ultimately prevail. God's plans prevail. And so here we are today. We celebrate the newborn king. We celebrate joy and peace and the hope that he brings. We rejoice that salvation is available. It's available to you. It's available. We rejoice in God's kingdom. We rejoice in life, eternal life. We celebrate at Christmas the birth of our king. He is and will always be the king of kings. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please? So next Sunday, how many services? One, One service at 11 o'clock. We're going to start a new three-week series next Sunday titled... Building biblical relationships, and in three weeks, start next week, and it'll go for three Sundays then, we're going to go through the entire book of Philemon. Wow. In three weeks, it's going to be fast, right through the book of Philemon. Yes? Yes. yes. So come and, and join us. Oh, yeah, somebody said yes over there. Okay. Um, the 20, Sunday, December 26th, one service, 11 o'clock. Sunday, January 2nd, one service at 11 o'clock. What time, though, is that Christmas Eve service? Nine. Excellent. Oh, man, you guys, you're so good. It makes me, uh, it makes me feel like I'm an excellent teacher that you guys can. <laughs> <laughs> Bow your heads and pray with me, if you would, please. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to this world for us. We needed a Savior. I needed a Savior. We needed a Savior. Thank you for being that savior. We thank you, Lord, that your plans prevail. Help us, help us, give us wisdom and insight uh, to follow you, to walk with you in such a way that um, we're on board with you, your will, your plans. I pray this for myself. I pray this for everybody who's watching online. I pray this for every person in this room. Bless them in that way, Lord. Holy Spirit, may they sense your blessing even now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless them. Uh, Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas.